So I thought that we would talk next week about blocking and how we can use uh, now blocking is the just um, picking out spatial areas in a field setting uh, to perform an experiment. And the whole point of blocking is uh, if there are systematic spatial changes that we account for them statistically. And, and the way that we do that, the modern way that we do that is with a mixed effects model. And so um, we're just gonna go through a, an example next week. And, uh, and I'll also sprinkle in a little bit of reminders and resources about mixed effects models because we have quite a lot of them in the old storeroom now associated with Herrig and also with the EDA module. So uh, if you have that kind of data or you're interested in learning a little bit of the technical details, um, we will go through those next week. Now, after that, what I've just kind of surreptitiously suggested is uh, something kind of fun on the 15th, uh, a Christmas card data viz activity. Here's what's in my mind. What's in my mind is that we, we, um, we come up with some may, maybe Christmas related data sets. And my idea is that uh, we come up with a few of them and have a little mini hackathon. Now, uh, what I'm gonna suggest next week is that everybody starts to thinking about getting a data set and coming up with a Christmas related um, uh, data viz or holiday related um, data visualization, for example. What if what if somebody came up with a, an open data set on reindeer ecology? Somebody has got their mic on. Can I just ask you to check and turn it off if you couldn't, because I can hear some shuffling and snuffling. Um, and to think about making a, you know, appropriately colored Christmas themed, something that could be maybe humorous or maybe be a, a um, Christmas card would be interesting or fun. But what I'm gonna suggest is that um, we, we do some work outside of the meetings and then we bring some examples to the to the meeting. We use that meeting um, that still won't be in person. I'll come to an in-person meeting as a topic in a moment, but uh, we'll use that to um, yeah show off, show off what we've come up with and maybe we could do a little live coding uh, as well. And and if you, if you don't come up with a data set and haven't had time to come up with your own visualization, anything you bring to the table would probably be fun and we could do some live coding like, um, like uh, let's say you have any kind of visualization that you might wanna make. We could talk about how to how to colorize it and how to make it Christmassy. I thought it just might be fun to do that. Um, and then I have a couple of topics for starting off the first few meetings for next year. Um, George, um, we talked about doing a, uh, a walkthrough of how to create a reproducible workflow to make a report uh, using Markdown, either in a PDF form that's kind of nice to summarize reports. It's something that <clears throat> I haven't always done it myself, but it's something I have been doing recently just to streamline my own workflow and to quickly communicate results to others. I've been doing PDF reports. So George is going to walk through how to do that with an example. And then um, Matt has got one of the coolest things that I haven't tried yet, but I would be really looking forward to trying this and, and using it myself in the future, is a, an API for scraping um, spatial data from the web and visualizing it. So he'll, he'll walk us through that and tell us what's that about. Now, I wanna mention this right now, and we can, we can talk about it if we want to, or we can just jump into the uh, activity I have planned, but um, a few people have suggested, especially Magda, uh, some form of in-person meeting. Uh, now, the, the a few dates have been suggested, and we just casually talked about a few things, and there have been a few emails that haven't been to the whole group, but if you have thoughts on what form that would take and how that might happen, now would be the time to to mention that. I might invite in just a moment, I'll say a few remarks myself, uh, and I'll invite Magda to say a few remarks, but uh, here's what I think the idea is. Um, I think the idea is that it's been a long time and we've been in, um, we've been in uh, quarantine mode. We've even had a couple of um, hex logos for the quarantine meetings. Now we are probably getting to a time where we could hazard an in-person meeting 
And when I suggested that, this was this was before the new Omicron variant had come out, and there have been there's been a little um, you know clenching nationwide, let's say. And I, and I know the official guidance is from the government that we shouldn't restrict ourselves on in-person meetings as long as we follow the rules, and that, that's fine. Uh, and there has been a little constriction on campus. And probably, uh, whatever we decide to do, we should probably consider, um, you know, reserve the option to reconsider our position in a week or two, uh, like the nation is doing. So having said that, the um, the uh, suggestion, I think, is to do something social, something that's very inclusive of everybody. And, and it could be a meeting, something as simple as meeting on campus for uh, coffee and or some kind of beverage and um, possibly, uh, you know, the, I remember now that I've been thinking about it, we did do a Christmas activity two years ago where um, we brought in some some Christmas pies and we just we still just had a normal meeting and we could do that as well. So I I didn't I haven't planned regular meetings between uh, the two or three Wednesdays that would happen between the 15th and the 12th of January, but some dates that were suggested might be when the kid when the kids if it were were more of an informal social purely social thing, and especially for people that are um, living away from home over the holidays maybe we could meet over the holidays. There's a Wednesday on the on the 29th that Magna suggested, and also it was suggested um, the first week back would be, I think it's January 5th um, on the week back. Or we could uh, we could do something, there probably is time to even have a, have a meeting on campus, or maybe we could meet on campus and take it elsewhere. Anyway, those are the things that have been suggested. Um, Magda, would you like to Tell us your vision. Hi, uh, Hi uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I think you have exhausted what we have discussed already. So I have my camera on, but I am on my mobile only because my computer doesn't want to get connected to the Wi-Fi, to the hotspot. Anyway, I think I will just send a survey monkey, monkey survey, survey monkey, to find out what are your thoughts, but I think uh, we all deserve to have um, at least one <laughs> in-person meeting. It for, I didn't uh, consider, but I think it also might be a very good idea to meet in person on campus in the common room or wherever we could bring our own food, which would obviously be uh, maybe easier for some of us. But uh, it, I will just include all these thoughts on a server monkey and uh, let's uh, have a look. What are your thoughts about it? I think that's a great idea to do a survey monkey. You know, it crossed my mind as you mentioned the the fact that some people might be close to campus and away and and it, it would be nice to have them in person is I wonder if we could just ask. I never have asked Martin Hare if there's any money to uh, to do anything for the graduate students and I, I just thought maybe we could ask him if uh, you know he couldn't buy some uh, drinks or uh, you know we couldn't get catering involved in an on-campus thing I don't know it's just an idea but sent the survey monkey is a good idea for the date and maybe the activity that's a good idea very good idea so good. please okay so, so I'll, yeah I will do it thank you cheers okay okay um so I'm just going to drop the link for the page today. Let's get on to what we're doing today. Now, uh, <clears throat> if you remember a few weeks ago, we did a, an NLP, Natural Language Processing Basics in Python activity because um, Iona Wang was interested in doing that with her research. And it, to be honest, um, I thought, well, we did something very quick and we did a word cloud and we did a, a very basic sentiment analysis um, just just to get the idea out there. And today I went a little bit further and um, what I've what I've done today, th this is actually quite a big topic and uh, for doing it in Python as well. The, the coding that I'll show you today is very easy. And, and as a matter of fact, if you guys are 
willing, I believe that every single person could follow straight along with the code today if you want. But uh, it's such a broad and deep topic that um, we we still are just going to take it a little bit further today. The, the thing that I've prepared today is much more substantial than the first week. And it, 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 I went as far as to set it up and, and even test it with real um, novel data that I harvested. I, I literally harvested it today from Amazon, which we'll come on to. It's it's in a state now that somebody could ask, um, could take this, this um, notebook and use it for a simple research question to predict sentiment uh, for their own their own work. Um, but even with that, it's it is just scratching the surface. Um, so what I've also done is um, I've, I've based the notebook I'll show you in just a moment uh, on on a, a book that's brand new that just has come out on deep learning in Python. Quite a good book. It's a book I know and I teach with it and a few of you would have seen that um, this year in the deep learning class. But I, I couldn't even go through the whole chapter in the time that we have. And so uh, I've got one that I'm going to go through that is self-contained. I've made it so that it's self-contained. And then uh, um, the actual authors of the book broke this particular chapter up into four notebooks, if you can believe it, with showing all sorts of variations. So I've just included the raw um, last three notebooks here if you do want to go further. But this should open for you if you're set up with a Google account and you're logged in and it should open just that easy as I've just shown you. So I've set this up as usual like a web page and um, you, you can feel free to watch me go through this and talk a little bit. I've made a little bit of background information just enough and uh, run it later yourself or you can run it with me at the same time. The, there are a few blocks that where we're going to train our own, li literally train our own neural network um, um, model and they only take about two minutes to run once you're up and connected and i think this time i've remembered to um, remove all the outputs so you you can watch me um, go and talk or you can run it yourself at the same time and we can do it together so um, now i've taken this material from this book it's by francois cholet a very famous um uh, deep learning scientist who was a professor, a sometimes professor uh, at Stanford um, University in the States, I believe. Uh, but he also has, has been um, a lead researcher at Google uh, as as part of his appointment for for many years. And he's he's a student and a colleague of some of the greatest artificial intelligence researchers um, for the past couple of decades. And, and this is the second edition of his, his really nice little book that is called Deep Learning in Python. And, it, and it, this has literally just come out um, in the States just a few months ago. And uh, it, it is really good. It's compact, it is cutting edge research, and it is so simple um, to run the code in there. So I highly recommend it, not not to uh, lay it on too thick about that. But um, reading that book alone, the it's a very that's a very practical book. And reading it alone, if you want to really get into what um, sentiment analysis tools, um, I haven't I haven't whipped out a Venn diagram on this. But um, if we have a very large circle that encompasses what we might call artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, <laughs> you know, it's become a monster to just to explain to um, other people what it is. It, it now is used to encompass almost almost all computational tools. Uh, so sentiment analysis is uh, is in a much smaller circle in all of AI. But um, there's there's a there's an intermediate size circle that is called natural language processing. Um, and and really, to um, the, the natural language processing is just one chapter in this deep learning book. Deep learning itself being a um, a subset of AI. And uh, and what Iona asked, and what inspired 
us to talk about this was a specific kind of natural language processing called sentiment analysis. And so uh, the, the state of the art textbook for sentiment analysis, this is not a coding book at all. This is just talking about how to answer research questions. It's very easy to read. This is a fantastic textbook. I, I sort of wish I had encountered it earlier in my career uh, myself when I was um, when I was doing old fashioned kinds of statistics with colleagues doing surveys. There's a lot of that that goes on at, here at Harper, even though I haven't really been involved in any of it. I don't I actually don't really like analyzing that kind of data with traditional statistics, but it's much more fun to do with natural language processing. So uh, if you want to um, break down uh, human text or human speech, to some sort of analysis of uh, how people think or feel about a topic based on a small amount or a large amount of text. We call that sentiment analysis, and we went through that um, a couple of weeks ago. This is a great textbook. Um, and then this last textbook <coughs> is on transformers. And um, transformers are a particular kind of model that have come to absolutely dominate um, all uh, of the AI. I, I, the way that I think of the world is the two really, really popular forms of AI right now are the computer vision AI that uh, does detection and classification of videos and, and you know, now is, um, is actually generating new content from videos and, um, and, and uh, pictures. And, and the other kind is uh, a model where it, we are analyzing something that has a sequence, like a sound or or text. And uh, the kind of sequence model that, that has come to dominate everything is called a transformer. Now, we're not going to go through a transformer today, but well, um, some of those other notebooks that I that I uh, link to, you know, do go into transformers. But this is a pretty good recent book. Um, that is getting a lot of good reviews by a well-known, uh, very applied in the business world data scientist uh, on transformers. Transformers uh, are big business these days. They, they've got their biggest application in in advertising sentiment and the kind of um, things that people do and say in social media uh, in relation to uh, ads and whether people will click on things and buy them and engage with social media. So that's one of the biggest things, but they're also big business in software as a service. So if you get a job at um, as a data scientist at a place like uh, like um, um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, one of those kinds of places, um, you know, it's very likely that you would be required, or at least you'd have an advantage knowing about and uh, using transformers. So. I wanted to say these three resources because we are just crossing um, crossing uh, into the very edge of what's a what's a big ocean of topics. Now, um, <clears throat> I wanted to give a little bit of background, and and this is structured just like it was as the authors um, have provided these notebooks. But I've a I've added a little bit of my own text and some some diagrams from the from the book as I see fit. There's no there's no text in the notebooks that the um, that are associated with this book. So with the other notebooks that I've zipped don't have any of any text or explanation. So I've added this stuff and I'm just going to pause to go through it a little bit as I run it. I've mentioned a little bit last time what natural language processing is and it's used to answer questions like, um, you know, what is this text about? So we might call that text classification. Let me just run that again. Whoops. Um, or um, we hear a lot in the news about content filtering and how it's the responsibility of um, those those big social media, those big rich um, social media companies. Uh, I mean, I w I also want to get riled up when I hear when I hear in the news about how bad these companies are, and I also like the you know, I think it. I think it is funny to um, to think about the foibles of the people running them and the companies themselves. But, but you know, this is not a trivial problem um, to to decide the sentiment of whether text contains abuse. 
Uh, so we, we might call this content filtering and all of those companies have invented the tools and released them to the world immediately to try to do this. So it's it's a very hard problem that all of those companies are heavily investing in. They, in fact, they all have whole departments doing it. Does the sound text, uh, does the text or sound of the voice uh, contain a positive or negative sentiment? That sentiment analysis. We could do language modeling um, where we're specifically talking about the order of parts of uh, speech course translation, Google um, translators were one of the um, first and remain one of the most um, successful transform. It, literally, that's uh, that that is where the word transformer comes from, from uh, translation applications. Um, and also summarization. Uh, th this is used. Um, a really interesting application of this is a, um, to show a scene of a picture use the computer vision classification to, to describe the scene of, um, of a video or a picture and then use a transformer to uh, to summarize the contents of the video but you could just shorten text like a um, I don't know if they have readers digest in um, in England but uh, in America for people that are too busy to actually read a book they have these uh, whole magazines that come out that just tell you in one article what a whole book's about so that sort of thing. Now, um, one of the big things that we're not really going to go into today that you have to do with this, especially if you're going to train your own model, is you have to prepare the text. And we can do some of it, and we will do some of it with computational tools right now. But this is a big deal, and it, it takes a lot of your time. Um, how much of your time does it take? Well, if it's going to take 100 hours to do something, I've said this a number of times in here, the classic model for how much time it's going to take to prepare your data is 80% of your time. So most of your time is going to be faffing around getting your data, and it goes same goes for any statistical analysis as, as well. So there are a couple of, um, of uh, stereotypical stages that we go through when we're preparing textual data. We start with raw input, like a sentence here with punctuation and everything. And then we go through a step that's called standardization. So standardization does a couple of things. Uh, one thing that it does is shown really simply here, it removes capitalization and punctuation. Another thing that's not really stone shown here that is um, essential in any sophisticated um, data prep for this kind of task is to do what's called stimming where um, you take a word that um, might be let's say a verb that has different um, forms of the verb like in a in french the verb forms are in english uh, you know sitting sat has sat that sort of thing and you um you uh, transform it's called stimming, but you transform uh, those different variants of uh, words or phrases into uh, into just one entity. So that's standardization. And then um, tokenization is something we'll do several times today is where we we break up the raw data into um, into symbols. Usually the simplest one is just a single word for everything. And uh, there's some issues with that because words like the and and a um, they're very common in speech and they'll tend to dominate the, those tokens those few tokens that themselves don't really have any meaning don't have any contribution to actual context or sentiment they tend to dominate these data sets because they're so frequent so when we tokenize our data um, we need to to think about that and then we index the tokens oh i wanted to say too when we tokenize the data um, there's a way of, of calling tokenization where we can have just one unit in a token that might be just a single word, but we could have m multiple units. We can have whole phrases. So you can have two word tokens and uh, you can you can set the library manually. Of course, you'd be crazy to do that in almost every situation. So mostly we would we would break them up into um, sets of two tokens or or three tokens and we call them um, uh, one grams, two grams, three grams, or in up to n grams. Any any number of tokens 
uh, that you want. So uh, what we're showing here, what I'm showing here in this picture from the textbook is um, just a single grand. Then we index the um, tokens um, numerically. And this is what we use in a statistical model to find statistical associations with with some sentiment. So uh, they're just usually numbered from um, from one up to some some number, however big your dictionary was. If the dictionary that we'll run a little bit later today, we take the 20,000 commonest words in a in a whole library of text and there, there might be more words, maybe a few people are exercising their vocabulary or have flamboyantly misspelled some words or something like that. Uh, so we get rid of those really rare ones that way. And then finally, we do what is called uh, one hot encoding, where we take um, a single. Uh, th this is common in pictures as well, and I'm just going to verbally describe it again. There's a lot of background that we just can't go through in in the time that we have here, but you know. It's here if you, the materials there if you want to get into it yourself. This is a way of summarizing words in a text document and we can sort of think of um, we can sort of think of uh, each of the columns here as uh, a, uh, a a possible a possible word in our dictionary. So in what I just described, there might be twenty thousand columns. and then each row is actually a um, one of the uh, one of the the data fields. So maybe it's a paragraph that somebody has written in a movie review. Let's say that's the example we'll we'll use for this. Or maybe it is the free response section of a survey um, where uh, someone is allowed to to write what they think and feel. And uh, the way that this is uh, encoded then is uh, you have a one for the presence of for uh, of a word for each of those possible word categories and a zero if it's not present. It's just that simple. And so if you have a big dictionary, almost all of the um, the uh, one hot encoded uh, section of the data to summarize a particular individual response will be zeros, you know, unless you have really, really long responses. So to put that in perspective, like an average scientific paper, would be around 8,000, six to 8,000 words uh, long. And, uh, you know, there'd be a lot of repetitive words in there. So there might be only, you know, half as many actual unique words or less uh, in a scientific paper. So that sort of thing. <laughs> so um, this is just some textual examples. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. So uh, if we had these two, um, sunset came, I was staring at the Mexico sky. Isn't nature splendid? Sunset came, semicolon, I stared at the Mexico sky. Isn't nature splendid? You know, two, two uh, um, question marks versus one in that example. So for these, they are essentially exactly the same information but those little details are different. So if we remove going through the steps in that diagram, the punctuation, now we still have a couple of little differences. Um, we have the different um, letter from uh, the Spanish alphabet, and we haven't, um, we just have a, a little bit of a difference between staring and stared. And other than that, after removing the punctu punctuation, it's very close. And now here we use the stimming. Uh, where we um, change the two forms of, st of the verb stare to stare into a stemmed version of stare. So, uh, you know, going through this process, we can standardize something that, you know, they're very, they're very similar, but now they're identical for machine um, purposes. Then we do the text splitting, the tokenization, and I mentioned that we can do it for single words or different numbers of words. Can also do it at, at the level of characters as well. That would be unusual. But you know, here's a little cartoon uh, or or a little um, box that explains this. So um, if if you have ingram or some other bag of words, it's sometimes called a way of doing it. We could have the the cat 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 sat 
sat, sat on, on, on the, the mat and mat. <laughs> and so we could also decompose it into three, three grams, the, the cat, cat, cat sat, the cat sat, <laughs> and so forth. So this is um, how this works. So that's a choice. That's a design choice. And I guess um, part of the choice that you would make in in uh, running your data, we'll, we'll do it several ways here. Um, you'll see the code is very easy to do. Uh, if you have a really big data set, we're working with a pretty big data set as an example here, as you'll see in a moment. But um, if you have a really big data set, there will be a cost, a computational time cost in trying different variants, but typically you would you would probably either have an idea of what exactly you wanted to do, or you would do a little bit of experimentation to, um, to tune your model. All right, so once you've got your text split into um, tokens, you, um, you uh, build your index and uh, do the one hot encoding um, steps, and we'll just do that in code down below. Now I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. I know it'll be harder to read but I want to I want to do it to um, to be able to open this part of the um, the uh, notebook here. Okay, so this is just over on this wall. We have a number of things that we can um, open up, and I've just clicked on the folder one. Now, when we're clicking on the folder one, we can um, we have a couple of options, and you can link this to Google Drive. And if you save this as the Google Drive, um, you know, you can do all sorts here. I've kept this as simple as possible with a little experimentation. And I'm just using the virtual memory space that's the default. So if you open it by the link, it should look almost identical, if not identical to mine. So uh, what we're doing here is now this is just a way to illustrate what, um, what we're going to do. And then we're going to do it. Uh, remember, there there is this this framework for um, for doing artificial intelligence there, there in fact there are multiple frameworks that are that are very popular today I want to say and I, I was in my mind thinking I'll say that they compete with each other but they actually don't really compete with each other instead they're just tools just like libraries in the R ecosystem but these live in the um, Python machine learning ecosystem they're, they're just tools there for you to use as you wish. And uh, the ones that we're going to talk about today are the ones called TensorFlow and Keras. Now, TensorFlow and Keras were um, paid for by the company Google, and Google immediately um, released them into the wild for the world to improve and use as they see fit. So they could they could use them for free to do anything, free beer, but they were also free being open source to make them better or alter them, even turn them into commercial projects, uh, pro products themselves. Now, Keras, I didn't mention this before, is the project that's, that is led at Google by Francois Cholet. So the guy who wrote this book uh, is the guy who has directed the creation of Keras as it is today. What Keras does for us, what TensorFlow does for us, is it gives us um, tried and tested algorithms for deep learning, for artificial intelligence, um, neural networks. Those are all jargon terms that have some differences in some lexicons, but uh, essentially they're all they're all uh, models for artificial intelligence. Keras, what Keras does is it's a it's a set of utilities to standardize to standardize um, data workflows, data pipelines, but also um, uh, creating efficiencies within the TensorFlow framework. So the Keras and TensorFlow work very closely together, and they're the, they're the de facto standard for all deep learning today. This is something that um, Chole does just to show, uh, now if we didn't have TensorFlow and Keras, if we're not using any of the, the tools that he invented for Keras, we could still do this stuff with just basic tools that are used to um, manipulate character strings in Python. So he's importing the string library, creating a class that's kind of like this, it's um, analogous to what a package or a library would be in R. So we're creating a class that he's calling vectorizer. And then he's defining some functions 
um, within um, this new class. And th there, these are um, these are analogous to our functions. So uh, he's defining one called standardize, which is going to um, convert uh, using an existing function from the string package, um, all the uppercase to lowercase text is going to um, um, split text that has been punc that uh, punctuation has been removed from. It's going to um, create um, standardized tokens with those separate words that he's created. Uh, he's going to encode them with um, with uh, numbers and then create a, um, a vocabulary, a library of those tokens, and he's including an unknown for uh, something that, that uh, um, doesn't appear in the library later when you find it in novel text that you're going to test. And then he sets up a little data set with a little toy, um, a little toy phrase. <coughs> so let's go ahead and uh, do that. I'm just going to run that. Yeah, I'm going to run it anyway. So it runs that, and we're going to just um, test the the encoding. We, you could write any sentence in here. Um, so I'm just going to run this as it is, and it's going to print the encoded sentence. And so what this is going to do is it's going to take this as input, and it is going to um, remove the punctuation. It's going to um, tokenize individual words, and it's going to convert them to uh, a set of numbers, one integer for each token in the library. And it's going to print out the the token, so it should be some string of numbers. So three, two, one. So there we have. And if we kind of want to uh, kind of look at how this works uh, visually, um, the word rewrite is twice. I think that's the only one that a uh, that occurs twice. The word rewrite is twice, and we can see one, two, three. Rewrite is tokenized to the number five, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's the other five, and we can see what the um, the um, tokens have been converted to, uh, encoded to for the rest of them. We can also decode the sen sentence with uh, for a character string with our um, with our uh, function from our little vectorizer. So we can print out our decoded sentence as well. This is our encoded sentence, and we just pass that to vectorizer decode. And that should just print out the actual sentence again minus um, punctuation and look at that the um, the word still was not in there so it was replaced with our token for unknown okay so that that is a, a manual way of do it now most people everybody by most people i mean literally everybody who was going to do this if you if you are a data scientist unless you are really into computer programming and we're doing this just to edify yourself and learn about um, algorithms. You would you would definitely use this existing framework. It would be this it, the, if you didn't. It would be the same thing as um, in R when you go to perform a, a linear regression. I'm not going to use the uh, LM function, no sir. I'm going to write my own code from scratch to perform least squares regression. Of course, you would never do that because you might make a mistake and. Uh, it's not as repeatable, reproducible as other things. So everybody would use Keras and text vectorization. So now we're going to do exactly the same thing with um, text vectorization. So here we're importing the um, text vectorization tools from Keras, which is within TensorFlow. So uh, and we're we're um, loading up our output mode and we're setting it to integer. So that's going to be our our uh, output for whatever our input we do. Let's just run that three, two, one. That's just loading takes a second. I think I was talking to Matt or somebody about um, setting up a timer, but I noticed that um, some at some point since I noticed last time that uh, now Colab just has a timer built in, so we'll see how that goes in just a second. So now here are some services and libraries for a, for a, what you would do as a standard workflow for this kind of stuff. So we, we're just going to import a few libraries. I'm not going to take the time to talk about every little thing here, but I have put in comments for what things these are doing. It's doing the same stuff as in our our um, 
little class that we made above. So converting strings to lower place case, replacing the punctuation with an empty string and splitting the string. So just um, getting this set up. <clears throat> We're going to test it. <clears throat> Same text. And then we're going to um, display just like we did before. That's our, now this prints out our library, including the um, the unknown marker. You know, you should play around with this and put in your own test sentence um, later and, and test and make sure you see how this works. And you can also um, input your own your own text here to uh, to to explore how it works. OK, so we're just going to um, encode our sentence. Basically get the same thing and we're going to decode it back using Keras. OK, so we basically get exactly the same output with with a manual just using the plain old string tools in Python and also using this TensorFlow and Keras workflow. OK, I'm going to go a little faster so we can get to the end. So I was talking too much in the beginning as usual, but um, when we get to the end, we'll have enough time to uh, to actually play with it. And I, I downloaded some um, text from a Amazon review today to to check the sentiment out. But we can we can do some things live if we have a few minutes. But it might be fun to play with um, when we get down to it. So the data set we're going to um, play in, I guess to use this this code for a um, for a researcher, one of the um, things that we're going to do now is we're going to start with a fairly large data set that is a training data set. So to do sentiment analysis, um, you basically have two extreme choices. You could uh, you could do it the hard way. So if you have an a, a instrument or a set of instruments that you're interested in doing sentiment analysis on, uh, instrument it's just sort of the jargon term for a questionnaire or a survey design that's designed to learn something specific <clears throat> what you would do is um, you would collect uh, probably a fairly large number of surveys that um, that uh, have been analyzed manually for the sentiment that you're interested in and and classified manually so you'd have the raw text from the instrument from subjects and then you'd have metadata associated with each survey that um, is an assessment, a, a manual assessment of the sentiment. We're going to start, uh, that's one extreme that you would do. The other extreme that you could do um, is uh, I'm sure there exists for some kind of, um, for some kind of um, instrument constructs, an existing model and data set where somebody has already trained um, human subject sentiment for you. Now you would, if you're a researcher, you would have to find uh, an existing model that was close enough to yours to be able to adapt it and, and get what you want out of it. That probably is possible for almost every problem, but the better way to do it, especially for researchers, would be to uh, construct your own data set. Problem with constructing your own data set is uh, you need a lot of data to do this legitimately. So we're going to start as an example um with a data set from uh, a researcher that's it's actually a famous data set it's this guy has collated this data set and put it on his website he's also a stanford professor it's well known in natural language processing we're just going to download it and uh, we can kind of see some stuff pop up over here when we do that so let's just download that takes just a moment it's doing some stuff. We're unzipping the data. There we go. So let's see what we've got. Nope, hasn't popped up over there yet. Uh, we can dump some part that we don't need. And uh, I'm just going to um, list what we should have here. And this is going to make a huge output of um, a list of individual files. Oh, but it doesn't. Let's see if we um, maybe it doesn't because it's too big. I'm going to keep going and uh, let it have a chance to uh, update if it's going to do that. Hopefully it'll it won't act funny, but we can look inside one file. What should be in there it comes what should be in um, in all of this is um, there it is. 
is um, if you look here, I'm asking us to um, look inside the file called uh, called 10,000 underscore eight. And um, I think the record uh, for these is something like the uh, the 10,000th movie review, uh, or maybe it's the 10,000th subject for the eighth film that's been reviewed. So this is off that popular website, IMDB, Internet Movie Database, and it's just got loads and loads of reviews with free text comments. So let's look inside of one of the files and just, just to... Uh, um, make it crystal clear where I'm at as I'm inside this folder and I'm inside of the positive review folder is positive and negative reviews and there are loads and loads of ones that it's not listing probably because there are too many of them there they are so I'm just picking one of those I, I've got a couple of them let's just look at a few of them let's run that one. Oh, I've um, commented that out oh that's why it didn't run because I commented them Okay, so here's one that I uncommented. So this is uh, a movie review. Homelessness or houselessness, as George Carlin stated, has been an issue but um, for years, but never a plan to help those on the street that were once considered human who did blah, blah, blah. So this goes on. That was kind of a pontificating um, review. Let's look at this other one that I commented out. I first saw this back in the early 90s. I'll, I'll just imitate an American voice for you while I do this. I first saw this back in the early 90s on UK TV. I did it then, but I missed the chance to tape it. Okay, so they go on like this. Are they positive or negative? That's the question, sentiment analysis. Um, what we would tend to do is, um, we, this has already been done on that guy's website, but um, here is code to partition raw data into um, um, train, test, and validate subsets. So we would, we would train a model to identify statistical associations for sentiment. We would test that model periodically while it was being trained, and then we would validate the model um, with data that weren't used to train it, and, and it ultimately challenge it with new data. So this is just some code that does that. I'm not going to do it in the interest of time. Uh, let's just see what it says. I think it'll throw an error because it's already been done. Oh, it did just go ahead and run. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, set the locations of where the data live. And um, <clears throat> we're also setting a batch size of the number of files to process all at the same time. So I'm just telling it where in this folder structure the train, validate, and um, test subsets are. Okay, and so it's detected the files, and we can see that we have um, quite a lot of data here. So this gives you an idea of how much data are standard for this kind of test. Uh, the, the, in this example, it's a very large, so, you know, social media website um, kind of website, the IMDb. But uh, you do need a lot of data as a downside of of this kind of modeling. So we have um, twenty thousand. Uh, files that are in the training data set, 5,000 for validation, and another 25,000 for testing. So we've split the data in half, one half to make the model, and we've subsetted that 80-20, that's a standard split for uh, getting the model up and off the ground. So um, here we're just setting up, um, we're setting up uh, the shape of the inputs. I'm just going to run it. And um, these are, um, for the shapes and types of the string, uh, this is for the um, classes, the numbers and the word dictionaries, and then for the sentiment, we're just setting up um, types that um, that uh, are also uh, an integer here. Um, so just just the uh, sentiment zero or one, and then um, some tensors that have the the um, um, the actual raw tokens. I guess this this string um, target is for uh, not for the uh, it's for the dictionary. So one to twenty thousand, and then down here would be just one to two. Okay, so um, so we can process this like we did last time as a bag of words. 
and uh, just having the individual words. And so uh, here I've just set the limit, like I mentioned before, to 20,000. It's just limits the vocabulary of the dictionary that we're creating. Standard first step. Um, we're um, going to prepare the data set that, uh, um, that is just for the raw text. And then we're going to set up the, um, the um, subsets. So let's just do that. Should just take a second. So all of these are standard steps um, that, that we would do for any data set. We're just going to inspect the output of that. And uh, now we can see that we've got our 20,000 words. We've got our um, target for the tokens. We've got our inputs, which are those vectors of uh, ones and zeros for the presence or absence of any of those 20,000 tokens that are in the uh, dictionary and then a placeholder for the um, the output for the sentiment. OK, so here's the real interesting part. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot to this part, but you know, you could adapt this simple code and it would work on any problem, uh, I believe. <laughs> and it's the simplest possible way to set up a, um, um, a model like this. So uh, what this block does is it basically defines the, um, the model that you want. There is a lot to this, but um, I'm just gonna, gonna show this uh, as it is. So we're importing um, Keras from TensorFlow and we're importing the layers. And what we do when we set up a model like this is we, we decide um, how the statistical model works in subsequent layers and how many, how many um, layers that we have. So the statistical model in this case, um, I'm not going to explain all of this. There is the background that we need, but um, the uh, ReLU is one of the simplest and fastest um, activation functions for um, um, identifying a statistical association. Sigmoid is um, kind of old fashioned and much slower, but it could be more accurate. And we're just um, uh, defining what kind of layers we want to when we want to add into it too. So I'm not going to go into the detail of this. I'm just going to run it, get a description of our model um, returned, and we can play with it now. So we can train and test first our um, our yes no unigram, just one gram model. So we've we've made our model. We're going to use the get model function to call it. We're going to um, summarize it. And we're going to um, fit our data to the model that we've done. And we can see how long this um, takes to run. And what we'll get out of this is we'll get a, um, I'm going to do a couple of these. So I'm going to go ahead and run it because this one will take a few minutes to run. We get a summary of the, um, the model that we've constructed. So we have a couple of layers. We have our input layer. Now, traditionally, um, in in the millions of, uh, well, I, I think there are probably thousands and maybe tens of thousands of, uh, of deep learning papers coming out on a weekly basis uh, around the world. I think there probably are 10,000s on a weekly basis these days. Coming out on, uh, see you later, Juliana. <clears throat> um, and traditionally, you'd see the uh, the input layer would be the pictures, or in this case, it's the text. And then we'd have a couple of interior layers. This one has has three, a, a so-called dense layer with a lot of parameters. Wow, look at that. Then a dropout layer where we're, um, we're dropping zeros where there's no statistical signal. And then a final layer that's going to be used to make that prediction of sentiment. Then there's the output after that. So this should just take a few seconds. This is running all in, in the cloud um, in Colab. It's just up there in Colab. You can see that um, I'm loaded up. Um, it's executing down here. It's finished. It took less than a minute. If we mouse over, we can see it took, um, we can took, uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can mouse over that and get, uh, so, so 87 seconds, uh, it says in the mouse over. 
So I set it to run 10 epochs. That's 10 cycles of uh, learning. Probably this one might benefit from going a little longer, but that's long enough. We see some output um, stuff over here. I'm not going to talk about it right now um, because I'll show a graph in a couple of seconds. But uh, if we if we go down, we can see our overall accuracy for predicting sentiment based on, you know, this model that we just trained from scratch is 88.6%. Uh, that's, that's very good for this kind of model. So humans, to give you an example, have about a, if you're looking at pictures, uh, there's a classic data set called ResNet. <clears throat> It's pictures of things like dogs, cats, beach balls, cars, trains, planes, automobiles, that kind of thing. And uh, humans have about a 95% accuracy rate on that. And the best models these days are, are you know, considerably better than humans. And uh, humans probably wouldn't do as well as 88.6% on a sentiment analysis for a movie database thing. So this is very good and it only took us two minutes to run it. We did have quite a lot of data, 50,000 reviews to train and test. But let's just quickly look at what happens if we um, tweak our model with um, two grams, so-called bigrams. So we just did a, a single word model. This is a two word. So this has got the cat, cat, cat sat, sat. So it's got, you know, two grams have one and two words in them. I'm just going to quickly run this. The only change is that it's running two grams. Let's see if the uh, model does better. You know, I ask, um, you know, what, what do you think intuitively? We've talked about what is happening here. Um, do you think there is more information? Do you think there's the same amount, less or more um, in single words or does two words in all possible combinations actually add some value. So this would be the co positional context of pairs of words. That's all we're changing here. Of course, we could we could do this test with um, one grams. This is two grams. We could do it with three grams, four grams, five grams. So this should just take uh, also a couple of minutes, five um, epochs almost. We're a little bit after, so I know if people have to go up the recording, going and I'll stop it when it ends, but uh, just have one more to run after this and then I have a visualization on the last one. We'll just briefly end on talking about that. And the very last thing I've done on this um, that I'll demonstrate for those of you who can stay is um, challenging this model we've tested with um, movie reviews from a totally different database that I just harvested today. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. There we go. Let's see what the final um, the final accuracy on that one was. A little bit better. Remember, there's a little bit of error to this. Um, I, I would expect it to be better on a two gram because there's a little more con uh, context possibly. <clears throat> so the things that this would pick up that the other one wouldn't pick up on would be things like um, if you have um, words like um, terrible. That would usually be associated with a bad review, but the two gram um, would pick up on. Uh, I think this movie is very terrible, and versus something like um, you couldn't say this movie is terrible. <laughs> um, we might pick up on uh, some differences. So uh, I I don't I think this movie is not terrible. <laughs> so you would have not terrible for a favorable review versus very terrible for a bad review. Um, so there, it looks like there could be some information in there, but we would need to do more testing to really tease it out. Now, the last thing that I'm actually going to show is something called the TF-IDF encoding, and this is where we look at the frequency of, um, of particular phrases. So this one's with a bigram. So we would count the number of times. I keep double-clicking on that to, um, to uh, select it when I just mean to do this. So... Uh, what the IDF encoding does is it uh, counts the number of occurrences of certain phrases in our ingram. Um, so for the silly cat sat on a mat, no problem, Iona, see you later. We, um, we are just counting the number of words. 
So let's just go ahead and run that and um, set our vectorization up. And uh, the only thing we have to do to uh, set up the um, this uh, um, this frequency is uh, to set the output mode instead of to um, a simple integer. We're setting it to TDIDF. <clears throat> so let's do that. We'll run it the last model. So we'll just take the two minutes again. I only bothered plotting this last one here at the end so that there's some boilerplate code there for anybody who wants to play with this stuff. I didn't bother making very good graphs. They're not terrible, the default ones. <clears throat> While that's running, I'll, um, um, I did put in um, a call to set the model fit to a variable history so that I could save it and I'll put it to the plots. Then I'll just remind people that, um, you know, there are a couple of sub graphics systems um, in Python. The one that I'm using here is one that we've talked about before in matplotlib. So I'm importing that in num numpy to um, uh, use some of the vector tools in there. This one seems to be taking a little bit longer. That's OK. There it goes. It seems like it hung for, for a second there. And what we'll be looking at when I run this plot after this one runs, remember this is the one that um, it just adds a little bit of frequency data. Is it going to be better? It could be in some cases. We'll, we'll see it. And I'm just going to plot this one. First, I'm going to make a plot that is the accuracy. What's the um, accuracy for the um, for the um, for the train test uh, train and validate uh, for the the train and tested model versus the validation? <clears throat> then I'm also going to look at the loss, which is a measurement of the error. And what we expect is that the the accuracy for the model should go up. I've, I've plotted the accuracy for each epoch and we expect it to go up. And we would tend to look at diagnostic graphs, graphs like this to decide how long we need to train our model. We have a lot of data here. So we, you know, we've only got 10 epochs and we, we probably won't need a lot of data for a model like this with so much data. If you had a lot of data, uh, I mean, not as much data rather, did, didn't have a lot of data, might have to go further in the training. The loss is a measurement of the error, and so we expect that to go down. Uh, and we also want to look at the um, difference between the the um, the um, the uh, train part of the model versus the test. And um, if the uh, test is very very different than the train part, then uh, it probably indicates that we're we're overfitting our model. See how far we're going here. OK, so we're out and we get yeah, we don't get a big gain by um, using the frequency encoding in this one. Let's just look at these graphs. We'll get two graphs. Each one will have two lines. <clears throat> so you can run these multiple times yourself. Uh, and you'll get a slightly different shape um, each time. And it does have that shape we're looking for. And uh, it looks like our um, the training part of our data set is keeping getting better and better and better. And it looks like even with 10 epochs, um, we're diverging a little bit with our um, test from the train. So we, we probably possibly start to overfit just a little bit, um, even on 10 epochs with this particular data set. And here's the error. The training error um, goes down really fast. And again, well, the, the test error is going up a little bit, which suggests that, you know, we don't need very many epochs to, to train this. So the last little thing I'm going to do is um, to look at a test to uh, challenge this model on some simple data. Now, I've got a couple of fake ones, but I also went, I don't know if you guys have heard about this new blockbuster series that Amazon has done. It's called The Wheel of Time. It's kind of a fantasy novel sort of thing. It's a big production with big stars and everything. And 
I love it because I've been seeing it in the social media that people are really at odds about it. Some people love it. Some people hate it. And I just thought it would be a fun one. I just thought it would be a fun way to test this little model. And I'm pretty pleased with how this has turned out. So what I've done is let's do a little test. Um, we're just going to set up our inputs to, to actually challenge the model we just trained with novel data. I'm not going to linger on this given the time. And then I've just, I'm just going to run this multiple times. I've set up um, some fake reviews here, and I've just written some text. The actress was terrible and the writing was bad. It's obviously a bad one. Here's my second fake review. The actress was relatable and the writing was fabulous. Um, and so then what I've got down here is uh, we're going to um, just set it up. We're going to um, take our um, take our um, fake review text. We're going to um, convert it to a tensor with TensorFlow tools, and then we're going to challenge our um, our um, uh, model with that that new string. So what all I need to do is copy that, paste it there, run this, and what we'll get out is a, a probability that this is a positive review. And we, if we were look at, look at raw outputs for lots of reviews like this, this is something like um, a researcher would want to do is you'd get the probability, set of probabilities that you have a positive or a negative sentiment or, or any number of um, classes that you want to trade these to. So let's do it. So the actress was terrible and the writing was bad. 11.31% positive. My fake review too. Copy. Actress was relatable and the writing was fabulous. Now I intentionally wrote kind of um, ambiguous, unusual language there. So what if we change this? So we get 48% positive. It thinks it's positive, but it's not quite sure. But what if I say the actress was great and the writing was good? And let's run that. Now we're up to 73% positive. Now for these last reviews, I, uh, I, I just took them off of my own Amazon Prime account on the first two reviews for the Wheel of Time that I saw. The first one was a two-star review. And if I just scroll across, there's quite a lot of text here. If I just scroll across, let's just pick one out. And there's little reason to care. Pike chews the set with some of the worst acting I've ever seen. It, it's <laughs> uh, yeah, some of the worst acting I've ever seen. This the lead actress is Rosalind, Rosamund Pike. The script is subtle as a hammer blow. All right, so this person really didn't like it. They gave it two stars. So let's see what our model comes up with. Wow. So they nailed it. Um, that's a really long review. So maybe you can get accuracy with more raw material to work with. So it comes up with 0.06% positive. Second review is a positive one. Um, gave the five stars. Seems there are two parties who have watched this. Ones that are new. Book readers who went in with an open mind. So it's a series of books, and it's got a cult following. It's quite old books. Um, and, you know, fantastic. I'm a massive fan. I um, So the second review is very positive. Let's see what the, we get in our model. We'll run it. Um, probably because of ambiguous language and it's long and rambling, and maybe because they talked about the bad reviews also in this good review, it only scores it at 30.47. So that's one of the foibles of these models. Any comments or questions? That's that's all of this code that I've got. We've gone over time significantly, so I'm going to end it there. Any comments? That's really, that's really interesting. interesting. Thanks. Feel free to play with it. There's more there. That's a fantastic book. If you're interested in this kind of thing, if you wanted to use it in research or just to edify yourself, that book is um, probably the best place to start. It's fun does, as it is. That, to put. Is that, is that the tensor, tensor function you just used? Is that, has that turned it into the numbers? Is yeah. Okay. Yeah. The model, uh, the model will push it through, um, through, uh, 
the functions in TensorFlow will push it through and and match it up to um, to the model. I think down here in this function is where that will happen. So, so what does raw text data look like now if you just print it? Is is that just a list of ints like before? I think it's the words. Uh, I think that's the words, and it'll. But let's see. Let me print it. Yeah, it's just the uh, just the character string of the words. It'll be broken up down here, I think. I think. Let's see what the predictions look like. Well, the predictions are are that. It's. I, I think just the TensorFlow tools automatically do it. If you look at some of the TensorFlow functions, they're very deep. This is just the boilerplate that I came up with. I didn't even explore it very much myself. Well, it's all there to explore, explore. So thanks for that. No problem. All right, guys. I'm going to uh, end the old video there.